welcome um, to the Film Academy Day at the BFI London Film Festival 2020. My name is Alex and I'm the Film Academy Festival and Events Producer. And we are so delighted to host a hotspot with Kathy Brady today, the Screen International Star of Tomorrow and NFDS graduate. Um, she's here to talk to us about her career, but also about the making of her uh, BFI back debut feature, Wildfire, which screened at the Toronto International Film Festival um, earlier on this year in September, uh, and which is screening tonight at the BFI London Film Festival. So it's at the BFI player at 8.30 p.m. tonight. Uh, I hope you'll all be watching. Um, hosting our session today uh, will be Will Massa, and he's the curator of contemporary fiction film here at the BFI. Uh, but just before I introduce you to Will, I just wanted to um, give you a few um, housekeeping tips. Um, well, first, I wanted to introduce our Film Academy team. So managing the chat box today, we have Noel. Um, so if you have any questions for our team about the BFI, about the Film Academy, our courses, London Film Festival or um, the Future Film Festival, then please pop those questions in the chat box. And also just feel free to introduce yourselves, um, uh, talk to each other, um, tell us what projects you're working on, uh, what are some of the Cath Cathy's short films that you liked. Uh, but if you have any questions for Cathy, then my colleague uh, Laura is managing the Q&A box. So please uh, make sure that any questions for Cathy, you put them in the Q&A box. Um, and I think um, uh, that Will will devote some time at the end of the session. Um, normally we do 15 minutes, but I think he said he'll devote a little bit more time to your questions. So you can start um, inserting, inserting them in the Q&A box now, um, if you want. Um, I also have to thank our partners. Um, all BFI education events are supported by the Rubin Foundation. We have our funding contributors, um, Old Possums Practical Trust, and also our um, competition partner today is Lacey. Um, I also wanted to let you know that we've taken your feedback um, on board um, after our previous events and that um, you told us that you wanted more opportunities to network with each other. And until we are able to do so safely and host you guys in the blue room for some drinks to so the BFI South Bank, uh, we started a Facebook networking group for all of you to join and share your portfolios, profiles, contacts with each other. So Noel will post the link to that um, Facebook group um, shortly in the chat. Feel free to join and um, start meeting each other. Um, and just before I hand over to Will, I wanted to let you know that the session today is being recorded and the recording will be made available on the BFI YouTube channel after the festival finishes. So um, after Sunday, the 18th uh, of October. Um, I'll hand over to Will now. Enjoy your session. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, welcome to this hotspot with uh, Kathy Brady. Um, I can see that there are 34 participants who've logged in. Uh, I'm sorry that I can't see you. Um, I'm sorry that you have to see me, but that's the world we're living in and that we're not in a cinema in a slightly more intimate uh, physical environment, but that is where we are at the moment. Anyway, welcome um, and welcome to Kathy. I'm absolutely delighted to be joined uh, by Kathy today, screenwriter, director, whose debut feature, as you all know, Wildfire is playing at this year's London Film Festival. Uh, the film also played recently in the Toronto Film Festival to rave reviews. And as if that wasn't enough, Kathy is also one of the three filmmakers in the running for the prestigious IWC Schaffhausen Filmmaker Bursary Award this year. Um, so crossing fingers there, Kathy. Um, now, I'm lucky enough to have seen Wildfire. I think looking at the chats that are coming through, some of you may have seen it, some of you won't have seen it yet. Um, we're not going to be giving away any spoilers for those who haven't seen it, so don't worry about that. Um, actually, the emphasis of our discussion today is really about Kathy's journey as a filmmaker up until Wildfire. We'll be touching on Wildfire and talking about process and procedure, but we're not, you know, particularly for films with a, a, a thriller element, we're not going to be doing any plot spoilers, so don't worry about that. Um, what I do hope you have had time to see, though, are the three short films that were circulated and the brief making of documentary that was uh, sent round to you in advance um, because I think they give a real good sense not only of Kathy's, uh, Kathy's trajectory and development as a filmmaker but the making of documentary specifically also gives you an insight into the very interesting process um, that formed part of the making of that project. Um, Kathy and I are going to talk for about 30 minutes or so but this session is really for you and about you. So we want to give you plenty of time, as, as Alex said, to um, 
to bank up your questions and uh, and get them asked. And I'll try and get as many of those asked as I can. Um, but before we move over to you, I'm going to very selfishly, because I'm a big fan of Cathy's and I've been following her career for a long time. So I'm very selfishly going to ask her all my questions first because I want answers. So Cathy, hello. Hello. It's lovely to be here. Digitally. Good. Good. Digitally at least. Um, I'm going to open with a very general question because I think it's one that is, uh, you know, often interesting to hear, which is, where were you? How old were you? And what was it that made you want to get into this? When did you realise that filmmaking, which is a tough old game, yeah. and directing specifically, was something that you wanted to do? Well, like, I came to it much later, much later than these guys who were tuning in. So um, I actually went to art school first. And at art school, I was learning about painting colours, textures, and then I really moved into photography. And with photography, I was really inspired by the work of Gregory Crudson. So Gregory Crudson, he works with non-actors and actors, quite established actors like Tilda Swinton. And he, he would shut down entire towns, entire streets, just to do this one single large frame photograph. But what really blew me away was how, with a single frame, he evoked so much atmosphere, mood, character, a sense of like, the before the moment or just after the moment and there was just something like uh incredible about that and so i you know like you start out and you try to do your own photo versions of it and i realized that narrative and working with actors was really what i was about so i remember at art school there was there was this opportunity to do your own project so i approached these two other people in my year and i said do you fancy making a, a short film and it was a load of crap, right? But what I got from that was the collaboration. Mm. That first experience of making that first short it was like it was like a high. It was like I never stopped laughing, and I realized that I had found something incredibly unique. And my strength in terms of being able to be very articulate in terms of like what feels true in the moment that I was starting to sort of really shine and bring in all my sensibilities from art. So I realized I was in the wrong degree. Yeah. So um, it took me it took me a bit of time. So from then I I actually put a, a hold on my degree and I took two years out, and I you know started at the bottom. I made mm. teas. I just observed how set works, mm. um, and then I started doing set photography. And I, over the space of two years, I had the confidence to go. Uh, Do you know what? I'm going to transfer the remainder of my art degree into the film degree. So I had only one year left of my art degree and. I was very fortunate that the school where I was studying art also was the school that housed the National Film School in Ireland. So they kindly allowed me to do a direct transfer. And in that year, I made small change, which literally changed my life. Um, and I kind of just threw everything at that short, everything that all the contacts, experience that I had, and just really drilling down into what it is that I want to talk about, what it is that I'm interested in. So for me, that was, I have to set this story back in Newry, where I'm from. Mm. And I was really interested in the idea about uh, female characters and female characters being put on a pedestal. And the idea, especially a mother figure being put on a, a pedestal and what happens when they don't reach that. Mm. So, you know, really small change opened the doors and it allowed me the opportunity to go on the coming up scheme. Yeah. Not only that, that was a, a film that allowed me access to get into the NFTS which then was a complete game changer. I'm going to come come, come, come back to the NFTS um, specifically later, but it's it's great. And watching Small Change again, as I did the other day, it's 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 amazing when you go back to directors' earlier works and you see the sort of DNA or the or the blueprint for what they are for what sort of gnaws away at them creatively. And and the, the, you know many of the preoccupations in Small Change ha they they repeat in in, um, in in Wasted particularly and in Wildfire, which as you say is yeah. is female-centered narratives of, of emotional precarity, basically. But yeah. Female characters in difficult emotional circumstances. Yeah. Um, let's talk about short films, because you are of a, a generation, if you don't mind me saying, of filmmakers, where there was a slightly more traditional route to the first feature. You'd make a short, another couple of shorts, you might get an agent at some point, and then you'd go to the first feature. It seems to me now in this landscape, there are, there are, there are other route, but there are other more accessible route paths in, but you've made five shorts over about 10 years. Mm -hmm. And now you've come to your first feature. Do you, yeah. do you, would you still advocate strongly for the making of short films as, as, a, as a training ground? A hundred percent. Yeah. 
I'll tell you why, because <clears throat> in between the shorts, I obviously did some TV. But in the TV, you are literally a director for hire. You know, mm. there's, a, there's a world, there's a, you know, the writer really is a lot of the creation of that world, you know, and especially if you're a young director coming in, you really just have to facilitate what the production needs. So it's great in terms of your craft, your sense of speed, but honest to God, shorts is, it's where you find your voice. And, you know, they don't have to be made expensively. Um, I just think you need to figure out what it is you want to say. And that's what you get to do with shorts. Every short I came at, I came at it differently. My interest was how do I, how do I balance uh, improvisation versus mm -hmm. script? Because I really love improvisation, the likes of Shane Meadows' work, mm -hmm. Ken Loach. But then I really see the value in quite scripted work, you know, like Adrena Arnold, Lynn Ramsey. Mm -hmm. You know, they're really crafted yet they're still poetic do you know so i was like i'm drawn to both of these worlds and i think with um with my desire to work with actors incredibly close and collaborate i felt like i need to find something where i can both workshop collaborate build a world forecast and and somehow um still be able to shoot a, a certain amount of script so i think every short came out of differently like morning for example was a uh, in a strange way, morning is the one the one short that I feel very removed from because I don't have any experience of, thankfully, of homicide. So I, I mean, I I when when I came to that idea, it literally came from a photograph. I was literally on the on the tube. I seen this photograph on the metro of this woman. She was just kind of leaning into her hand. She had a weird half smile and really vacant eyes. And the the top headline read, "My worst fear realized." So I was intrigued going, okay, who's this woman who's got her makeup on, her earrings on, and she's giving this weird smile. As I read on, I realized her, her daughter had gone missing four weeks ago, and she'd been found murdered um, two days ago. And in that instant, I, w I judged that woman. I was like, whoa, how, how did you even manage to put your makeup on this morning? What are you doing getting your photograph in the papers? Why are you smiling? Mm -hmm. And in that split second, I was like, you have no idea, Kathy, what that woman's gone through. How dare you make a, an assumption? And in that moment, I realized there was something, the idea between private and public grief. And so I was like, oh, I don't, I don't think I, I don't know how to write this. I really don't know how to write this because it was so far from what I knew that I was like, this is my opportunity with a short to go right from the start and research. So I thought, I'm going to go one step further and I'm going to, I'm going to work with the cast right from the start. So uh, I approached Johnny Harris separately and I said to Johnny listen would you be interested in uh, investigating the role of a press photographer now you're not going to know anything about the story that we're going to do you're not going to meet the other cast member until the day is set are you in and he was like all right and I said well if you're in you have to understand this might not work so he's like okay even better so myself and Johnny met about 10 press photographers from various stage one guy who had covered the Maddie McCann case Another guy who had literally was just covering the local news at his mm. desk, you know, in, in the town. And from that, we were trying to gauge where our character sat. And um, with Eileen, I worked separately. With Eileen, we kind of, I said, listen, I'm going to be telling a story about a, a mother who's been bereaved through homicide. Would you be interested in going on a journey of research with me? We'd speak to, we'd speak to kind of counsellors, maybe some police officers. We'll, we'll kind of loosely map out what happened. But what happens in the film is you're not going to meet the other guy until the first tape. And that's literally what happened. So we had four days to shoot. And I said to all the crew, like, this might not work. So we're going to use images. We're going to use music. And here is the, the bullet points of what we need in terms of story. So what I had kind of worked with a, a, a co-writer, Sarah Wilner, and we had figured out what we needed from the story. But then when the actors met for the first time, she opens the door you know, it literally was a 20 minute take and it was incredibly exciting because you got two people who are meeting each other for the first time. And, you know, we were picking stuff that was really useful. And then on the second day, we got really cocky. We thought we knew too much. <laughs> the camera knew what it was doing. The cast knew what we were doing and it lost all the magic. And my editor rang me that, that second day and he said, you know, the magic you had in the first day is now gone. He said, you need to start over again. So I was like, Oh, so I got the cast down and I was like, right, I think we got something magic on the first day, but we need to go back to something that's both composed and slightly structured. So we're going to start from the start. We shot 22 slates in that day. We shot the bulk of the film that one day and it kind of found the, the organicness again. 
And then in the last scene where he, where she says to him, can you take me there? And Johnny as an actor was like, take your work. Cause in his head, he's like, we're just shooting in this house. Yeah. So there was a really nice energy. And um, so then we shot the exterior scene, the last day. That's so such th- a moving short as well. It, I mean, it, they're, they're, it's yeah. so strange because I, I feel so removed from that short in many ways because it's, it's so outside my own experience and I guess it's outside my own environment. So it was one of those shorts I just, I didn't know what I had until I finished it and started showing yeah. it to people. Um, so two questions I've got coming off the back of that. The first is, did, did, the, did what you learn it, on that short, which sounds like it was quite high, you know, quite high stakes in terms of something that might have just completely fallen apart and you didn't know. Has it now convinced you to, to take that learning and, and apply it into, into future projects? I mean, we'll come back and talk about Wildfire, which has an element of, of, of a slightly, um, you know, unorthodox development process. But are you now confident that that's, that's you? This is the way I'm going to work. This is, I'm not going to do the traditional send a script out when you'd expect it. I want actors on board right from the get-go and they have to come on a journey with me and that's my offer and hopefully they find that appealing yeah i think it's going to be a big part of what i do um and i think it'll be it'll, it'll be on specific projects um so like um because it's it's very the, the the higher caliber you work with the less time they have available but you know it really is about working with character actors and i think they're a very specific breed of actors you know, they're, they're actors that work incredibly well in, in, in workshop. And not every actor can do that. Some actors can read a script and give you a fantastic performance, but you put them in a workshop room, you're getting nothing. Yeah. So it really is about, for me, it's always the talent first. If, if I meet someone or I see someone's work and I'm like, there's something about that person, I need to meet them, I need to talk to them. Yeah. And so, so it really depends on the project. But I think with, you know, I, I always want to be able to kind of go from two worlds, from TV to film, and in film, I need to be able to just cast well, turn up, and deliver a good performance. So I think, you know, I'd like to kind of keep this approach for, you know, probably projects and features that, that feel right for it. Mm. But I think it's a skill set to have because I think it, it um, for example, through Morning, uh, where, when we got nominated for the European Academy Award, that gave me a profile in which Carla Crestadina then had seen the film Mm. was really curious about how it was made we chatted and and I realized that he understood the process so yeah. by starting to make work that feels right for you you start attracting people who are interested yeah. in your process yeah yeah you, you start to collect a little bit of a, a family and that that's also with the other crew that you meet the other actors that you meet mm. that people start to identify what your thing is and it takes a short to do that you kind of can get mm. lost behind tv work yeah. um so yeah <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned Johnny Harris because, you know, he's one of our greatest character actors, I think. I mean, he's one of our greatest actors. Character actors sounds like I'm damning with faint praise. He's just a great actor, full Mm -hmm. stop. One of the things I find often lets shorts that are otherwise well-written and well-directed down is, is that they fall short on performance. And I wonder... And I actually think people underestimate or emerging filmmakers sometimes underestimate the extent, the generosity of of better known names and really established actors to work on short film projects from Michael Fassbender, you know, and his early collaborations. um, You know, there there are loads and loads of of great actors in the UK who will work on short films, actually, very generously. Has that been your experience? Absolutely, absolutely. And I think with, with small change, you know, I hadn't written anything before that, but like, you know, I was always really drawn to Nora Jean Noon because I seen her in Magdalene Sisters and Peter Mullins film. I was like, who is she? She's incredible. Like she's got this wildness in her eyes. And, you know, I was, as I was writing small change, I was thinking of her in mind. So, mm. you know, I, I wrote, I wrote her agent this email that said, listen, I wrote this part for her, would she consider it? And it, we must have paid her pennies in her world, you know. Yeah. But I, I met Nora Jean and I was like, I was blown away by her. And equally, she's seen something in me. And, you know, we carried on. I did my master's graduation film with her. And then I did my feature. So, it, you know, the relationship continued. Yeah. And, you know, I think I'm very drawn to working with non-actors as well. So I made a film, uh, Kiss, with Thomas Turgus and Tom Hughes, who would be, you know, established actors. But then I put put them with two non-actors and you know I went up to Hull I think it was and we looked at 400 um, teenagers and you know we spotted these two girls amongst them and 
it, for me, that was fascinating, the, the difference of working with a non-actor and an established actor, because, you know, I think, you know, there's something that keeps, um, keeps actors on their toes when they yeah. all of a sudden there's a, a non-actor who turns up and they just hit these spots immediately and there's mm -hmm. a rawness and a realness. And they kind of go, oh, wow, I kind of have to take off this mask. I have to stop projecting a performance. I just need to sit in myself. Yeah. And equally, a non-actor sees what a, what a professional actor who's trained for many years and many films mm -hmm. and they can go, oh, there's a position. I need to hit that mark with this emotion and I need to deliver this beat here and I need to do take after take after take. So for me, I'm really fascinated what happens when you put those two yeah. elements together. I think it, it, it seemed to become very fashionable working with non-actors after particularly after fish tank andrew arnold's fish tank because of that incredible performance again though that's something that comes with its own risks do you for for filmmakers who are with us now who who are attracted to the idea of working with with non-actors are there any are there any uh, hard-learned um <laughs> experiences that you would you would caution against or is it about thoroughness in your search like what are the top tips for working with non-actors research and then you workshop you test them in the room you don't necessarily have to test them with the scenes that you've written and um, but you workshop the scenes with them so i mean like improvisation so Ultimately, you know what the beat of the scene is, you know, like, you know, what's the A point, what's the B point, what's your turning point in between? Can they deliver that? Can they change the performance? Can they hold the camera? Yeah. You know, and if they've got all those things, then, you know, it is a case of having time to work with them in a more detailed way. Yeah. But I think when you find those people, they really are remarkable. Like with Wasted, um, I worked with Barry Kogan and Barry Kogan hadn't really done anything then. So in theory, he was not a million miles off and on actor. But he was an actor. Do yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah, like yeah, yeah. He, Incredible so, screen presence. Yeah, exactly. It was the presence. Like literally you meet those people and there's something about them and then you put a camera on and it does actually feel like they've changed. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I definitely recommend, you know, if it feels right for you. Try it. Um, but I yeah. think you have to have something in their gut. They have to have a, something that you can't put your finger on that mm. makes you want to keep on watching. Um, I'm going to move on now to, to ask you about your time at the NFTS and I'm also going to uh, give a shout out to Jojo Bossman who's already um, got a, 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 a question fired up um, so in a way this I'm gonna Jojo I'm wrapping your question into mine because I was going to ask Kathy about the NFTS but I'm going to I'm just going to use yours I'm going to shamelessly steal it um, and the question from Jojo is how did your time at the NFTS change you as a storyteller and do you think your films would be the same if you hadn't been there Obviously, just for just for reference, I'm sure you've all heard of the NFTS, but it is it sort of regularly tops the the polls of the world's best film schools. Now it takes a handful of people a year. Um, some of our leading industry lights c c come out of that that master's program. So, what was it like for you, Kathy? What and what did it shift? Okay, hiya, Jojo. Um, what I would say is it. Um, do you know when I made small change, I thought it was a fluke. I was like. I've only done one short. It's done really well. It's got into Sundance. Maybe that was just a fluke. There was something about going to the, the NFTS where all of a sudden I was amongst peers who were exceptionally good. And, and I was so excited to be around. Like I'm, I'm people from all around the world. That was my first experience of working with international filmmakers. I was hearing about different cinema, hearing different languages yeah. and getting to, you know, these became my friends. And so that like all of a sudden opened my mind creatively in terms of dialogues and you, you know, you're talking about where you come from and then you're talking to someone from Norway and you realize, oh, he understands something that I thought I only understood. Um, but the beauty of the NFTS is it's two years, it's intense two years. And you know, I was very fortunate that I got a scholarship. If I hadn't got a scholarship, I couldn't have afforded to go. And that's the truth. It's an expensive school to go to. You know, you want to get a scholarship if you can't afford it, but there is scholarships out there. And I did have to take out, like, you know, but let's be frank, I did have to take out money in order to, you know, alone mm -hmm. in order to live in London because I was living in Ireland. Um, so there is, there was a cost implication, but what I gained from it was huge because in these intense two years, um, there's an amazing tutor, Ian Seller, who, I mean, that was my first experience of going, this is what a really good teacher does. I had no idea what Ian Seller's taste in cinema it was personally, because he was so he was so about drilling you down to what it is. What is it you're trying to say? 
what the hell does it matter? You know, and you kept on refining and refining and refining. And not only that, like you would have guest tutors who would come in and for morning I had, um, Stephen Frears was my mentor on morning. And I remember Stephen Frears goes to me, you know, this is a really good idea for a film, but you need to, you need to write a script. Mm. And I just thought, no, I'm not going to write. No, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> it was so interesting because it gave me that opportunity to go, he's saying it's good. Okay, maybe it is good, but I still have to stand my guns here. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so while you were often in prep on one, you're in post on another. So it's, you know, it's incredibly intense, but like incredibly valuable. So yes, yes, I think film school, like, you know, there's plenty of film schools. And you know whatever works for your budget or whatever, but the NFTs for me like literally blew my mind. Yeah, brilliant. And but I suppose it's worth saying that if you don't, if you're not lucky enough to get into the NFTs or even uh, uh, the other pro uh, sort of higher profile film schools, there are plenty of directors who've come through grafting outside of work. You know, I, I can think of Peter Strickland or Ben Wheatley or, or, or whoever it is um, who you know, just don't get, don't give up, I suppose would be the. <laughs> it's ultimately about getting the work made. Do you know what I mean? It's wherever that work is made and it's about the dedication and time and the people around you who are willing to give you that support. And yeah. you know, that might just be a gang of your mates just helping you shoot something over a weekend, or that might be a, a friend of yours reading a piece or another friend just, you know, improvising it with you. It's, mm. it's just about getting the work done. And, you know, I was just lucky that I, I happened to do it while I was at the NFTS. But I think my drive to tell story would still exist without the NFTS. Yeah. I, I'm really interested in, in filmmakers who stay local in the, in the sense that they are, they, they clearly have a bit between their teeth about reflecting where they're from or, 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 or they feel like there is a whole world of stories right under our noses if we look hard enough for them. I love, I love the fact that Mike Lee has never really not made a film in England, you know, out of his whole career. And your films have, have basically, I'm not sure where Morning is set, although the, char the, the lead character is um, Irish or Northern Irish. Uh, and yeah, yeah. But, they, but the rest are set in Newry um, or, in the, or on the Irish border, as is, as is Wildfire. Mm -hmm. um, you've remained committed to telling stories in that area. And in a sense, it's become part of, part of your USP that you were talking about earlier. Why, why, why is that? You, you, you... Well, like, I mean, the thing is, like I was like, I couldn't wait to get away from home, you know, and, and then, you know, I studied in Dublin and all of a sudden I realized that my experience of like growing up during the troubles was incredibly unique. Like I was like, I was telling someone, you know, yeah, I remember we were in school one day, we were studying an exam and a, a nun walked in and she said, girls, don't panic, but there's a bomb. And, you know, we were all delighted because we didn't have to do the exam and we were just sent to the back of the school while the army dismantled a potential bomb at the front of the school. And I realized that, oh, this isn't normal. And I realized that I needed to go back and revisit where I'm from. And I, I really think with wildfire, there's a big part of like, like it's a kind of a, it's a love story to that place. And yeah, it might be a dark one, but I have, I have such respect and love for that place that is very troubled and the people that come from it and then the more I do you know the more I hear about people and I hear their own stories and the dark humor that we have I realize mm. that I'm part of that mm. and I have a unique insight to that and I think I've spent many years watching trouble films or whatever and it's an outside view of what it means to live there and not that all my films have been trouble related but like with with I guess with Wasted and small change, it is about the idea of returning to a small town with big ambitions and how, how do you manage that when there isn't anything going on there? And I think anyone can relate to that who's come from, you know, uh, a big city back to small town roots. Yeah. I do feel like I've done the trilogy in one <laughs> sense. And yeah. I do feel I am ready to go international in terms of yes. story. It just has yeah. to be the right story. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, you know, talking about, in a sense, wildfire is, is I mean, I, it's, a, it's an unbelievably impactful, powerful, emotional film, but it also blends the personal with the political. And it's the most, it's, it's the first time you've, you've, you've broadened the canvas, I suppose, of your, of your regional, um, uh, interests to include the politics and the history of that area and and it's not a spoiler to say how those have shaped 
the characters inside the story. Um, and there's a couple of questions coming through that dovetail and uh, uh, with my next one. So I'm going to try and incorporate all these as a bunch. Uh, shout out to Eddie Mould and to um, Owen Astles, who, who are all asking about your process with Wildfire. I don't know if, if, um, if the group were able to see the making of documentary. If you haven't, please watch it after this. It's four minutes, but it's just, it's just, it, it, it gives some real texture and color to what, what um, you're about to describe, I think, which is, a really unorthodox approach. You, you've touched on it a little bit with your shorts, but this was a big, this was, this was extremely unorthodox the way you approached this. Um, I don't know whether we would even call it a writing process, although eventually it, it must have resulted in a script, presumably to satisfy producers and financiers. But can you walk us through the process of, of, of making Wildfire without giving any spoilers? <laughs> yeah, I think all the shorts that I had done to that they had given me confidence about my abilities to work with actors and to find story with that process um, and realizing that when you work with character actors like Eileen Walsh, Johnny Harris, Nora Jean that these people are really intelligent they are really emotionally insensitive and they they have you know they have real desires uh, to tell story and that when you just sit down and you start talking to them about what interests them that you find connections and I was I was lucky enough to um to work with Nora Jean twice and and then I came across a, a young actor called Nika McGuigan and I literally was like who is she she's incredible because she had this um she had like a bravado, you know, she was so confident and yet she was so she had the ability to be so innocent and and really kind of uh, delicate and I just thought wow that's really interesting what would happen if I put Norgian in a room with Nika and it took a few months to work it out but I literally sat back and I watched them talk for about five hours and it was like seeing two pieces clicking together they weren't the same but they were so complimentary and I realized I had something so I said to them, listen, I would love to, I'd love to find something to work with you with. I'd love maybe my feature. Like, would you be up for it? Now, if you're up for it, like we're going to go, like we're going to start from the ground up. It's a process. Are you in for it? And they were like, absolutely. So we began talking back and forward about what, what stories we were interested in. And mm. It was a, probably about six weeks in where I had said to the, the two girls, like, have you seen this documentary, Madness in the Fast Lane? And I'm not going to give too much of the documentary away because it became a very um, insightful moment for us. But basically, this documentary um, is about two sisters who have a, a shared psychosis. Mm -hmm. And it leads to this huge event uh, that it's, it's quite um, existential to witness what they did. And they survive. But people, are, even to this day, are confused about why they did it and how they did it. Mm. And that for us became a springboard about what would cause two sisters to behave in this such extreme way. What, what is a shared psychosis? Yeah. And, you know, it was in around that period that I, I met Carlo Crestadina, who had seen Morning. Yeah. And he was like, tell me, what are you up to? And I was like, well, here's, here's, here's 50 <laughs> images. Let me just play you a piece of music. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's so ballsy, like when I think of it now. I just play <laughs> And here's the two cast members. And, you yeah. know, this is kind of the film I want to make. Yeah. And he was like, okay, all right, this is going to be very difficult. You know that. He's like, <laughs> this, he's like this is the kind of film you're not going to know what you've made until you've finished it. Yeah. And he says, but I'm on board. And it's that. You find people with that sense of belief in you. And, mm -hmm. you know, you can move mountains when yeah. you have that. And then Charles uh, Steele came on board. And, you know, Charles really knew how to start to to package this project and the process that we could get funding to work in this way. And you know, when you start doing this, that you realize there's, there was um, the Welcome Trust, which I think they've now changed into a different name. But the Welcome Trust is really about supporting artists who are interested in science research-led projects. It's biomedical, isn't it, principally? Exactly. Because yeah. I, I realized if I was going to tell a film about shared psychosis, I would have to uh, understand it. So, you know, with that process, we got to experience, we got to experience talking to psychiatrists, psychologists. We even met two sisters who had a shared psychosis. And it was the level of detail. It was the level of detail of them explaining this, this one girl. She said, like, you know, she realized there was something maybe not right with her head when she realized uh, a wolf had followed her home one night. Mm. And I was like, what? That doesn't make any sense. And I realized that if I had just sat down to write this purely, I would try and make logic sense of everything. 
and with psychosis, there, it can't all make logic no, sense. It's too slippery. It's, it's, um, it has to be slightly abstract and, and strange. And I realized I was really going to be telling a character story. So, yeah. you know, we began workshopping because I had no script. So again, I was using music as a way and we played Patti Smith's song, Horses, which mm. is an amazing track if you, if you haven't heard it, nine minutes long, but incredibly primal. And I said to the two cast, it's like, okay, you've got to match the energy of this song. And the song has massive ups and downs and it's quite intense. And I was saying to the girls, like, because this is the energy you need to be able to access to play these roles, because there is manic energy at the center of this film. And with that, we started understanding the dynamic and how each actor worked. Nico was incredibly um, free and wild. And whereas Nora Jean, it was, I guess, she was more like intellectually wanted to understand how everything works before yeah. she went there. More in her head, yeah. Yeah, but, but not in a bad way. It's no. just it's a different process. And somehow you find this middle ground with these two actors and they be, they really became like sisters. Like they weren't best mates. They were like sisters, which is like they were able to argue, yeah. but they friggin' love each other. Yeah. And, you know, it, it was a really interesting journey of workshop and it. We went to Ireland for a week and played out some stuff in real time. Like, for example, uh, Kelly goes missing in the story. That's not spoiling anything. But when she yeah. returns home, we played out the idea of how might that feel? So we did a real time imp improvisation where, you know, I shot it over four hours and um, Nora Jane, she left the house and Kelly broke in. And, you know, I just let Nika do what she did. And she yeah. ended up falling asleep on the bed. And then Nora Jane came in and found her on the bed. And, you know, there was something really so small and truthful and delicate about that, that I don't think I would have got that from sitting right in the desk. Mm. So, the work the thing I should say about workshopping it's incredibly difficult because it's difficult on the actors uh, you know I get to sit back and I get to observe but the actors have to go 100% there they can't withhold if they withhold you get a false beat that leads to another false beat but if they 100% commit to the energy of the scene what it means to find your sister who you thought was missing lying on a bed you have to emotionally treat that as a real moment and then when you get that and you know you've captured it on camera, you know the power of it, then like you get to bring that into your script. So it's it's an unusual way of working, I guess. But for me, it became very clear reference points for what felt truthful and unusual. But I also bet it's no less efficient than doing it the traditional way. In some senses, you are putting in a hell of a lot of, of developmental work early on but it's not endless drafts of scripts it's it's character you you are inserting the character into your actors so that when they come onto set on day one there's no there's no switching anything on the, yeah, the, it's right. like that's it they're there they, they it, the muscle memory is there from yeah. the two years of, of of workshopping that you've done oh not only that but for them they find like it started to blur you know for them in terms of uh you know what because you, you kind of hear so much stories from other people and then you bring your own stories to it that it all became this really blurred thing that just was very real. And the thing is, what, what the results are in the performances, which are incredible in the film, and it's because of the commitment of these two actors. But I think what's true about this film is it is, has got a different feel, this film, because it has been made in a different way. So it will, it, some audiences will 100% get it. Another audience, it'll just go over their heads, which is kind of a difficult thing. But this is very character led and these characters are unique. So if somehow you don't somehow have a reference point for these characters or you're not willing to be led on a strange journey that feels real and awkward because that's life, you know, it'll feel strange to you. But like, I think this is part of what makes me excited as a storyteller and, you know, Maybe it's not a mainstream way of working, but I think uh, it offers up an incredibly unique way. And I wouldn't change how I approach film because I think what you get out the other side is incredibly interesting yeah. and honest. Yeah, there's, a, there's a, a couple of questions that have come through about um, 
sort of testing ideas and how do you know when, you know, I think this is pertinent to what you've been talking about. Like, you know, you're spending time basically stress testing the strength of your premise and your world and your idea. And, and um, Phoebe R and Anna Galoni have asked, uh, 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 shout out to you both, have asked um, a sort of similar question, which is how do you, how do you know when an idea is more appropriate for short or feature treatment? And, uh, and how do you know that when, when is it that you realize that an idea is actually sort of doable? That you can that you that you can realize it. Is there a moment where that clicks? They're really good questions. They are, yeah. Um, nice one. And um, what I would say is, okay. So, for example, with morning, uh, when I seen that photograph in the paper, it had such a visceral reaction on me, and I felt so personally guilty and ashamed of my own split split reaction that I sat on that for about six months and it kept itching me, it kept itching me. And I thought I didn't want to touch it because I didn't want to script it and because I had no experience of this. But then when you realize it keeps itching you, you're kind of going, God, I need to do this because it's not going to leave my system. And um, so for me, it's that sense of it just keeps coming back. It keeps coming back and I have to do it. Mm. Um, with, with wildfire, it, it was, I kind of, it was about like just seeing that connection. I didn't matter what story, I just knew I was going to tell a story with them. And um, then, the, then the premise was how do I find a feature world story? Mm -hmm. And you know, that really took, that took a good year of research and building character and building plot and then going to script. And then we, as you have funders come on board, they come on with their ideas of what's plot. Yeah. <laughs> you know what yeah. should work in this story but did you instinctively feel that there was mileage in the premise if you see what i mean that there was th th this this isn't yeah. a short this there's yeah. this we're going to go deep into here this is layered and, yeah. and rich I thought, honest to god from that first dance they did like the that one to horses i mean literally i would i wish i could show you the clip but like i literally sat back and i felt like i had the whole journey of the film and that dance and i'm not a dancer you know but I, I can read emotions and I was like the highs, the lows. And I was like, there is dynamic and shape in this. And, you know, I'm just going to work through it. And the more research I realized, the more backstory I realized was important. The more I had to grind it in the background, the more I had to sort of come back into my own story, what it meant to be in the borderlands. So it kept open all these pockets of stuff, you know, whereas I think with the short, it often feels like um, it's a really strong moment. Yeah. You know, um, and it's, it leads to that moment and, or it's the aftermath of that moment. And that's kind of what, what shorts are. I think, I think, you know, for me, I think with morning, um, because I guess it's, you know, I, I knew the idea of how did the press photographer take that photograph of her smiling? What would lead to that moment? And what would be the aftermath of that moment? And I didn't know, you know, what would happen, but I knew that's something I want to investigate with small change, I think it was, it was a bit wider in terms of what happens. I, why do we put mothers on pedestals? And then like the pressure that they're under and the idea of um, addiction and she's just trying to do the best she can. And I thought like, okay, how do I find a way into that character? And um, so that became, and I, I remember going down on Christmas Eve and I remember going into the slot machine place in, in Newry and just, you know, seeing this woman on the slot machine kind of going, it's Christmas Eve, why is she not at home? And then I realized she's getting money, you know? And I was like, oh, okay. There's a whole universe right there. Exactly, so you're looking yeah. for universes. And the thing is with shorts, you don't have, you just go for a, mo a moment, go for yeah. a character moment. And that can be five minutes. Yeah. It depends, like I'm very character driven. There's some, there's some shorts in the very plot. You, you get to the end, it's like, but I'm, yeah. whereas, I think for me, it's like about, I leave characters in a place where you're like, oh my God, really? Yeah. I, but I was just getting to know that person. And I, yeah. that's what I like about shorts, where you feel like you've got a doorway is opened, you get a glimpse and then that's it. Yeah. I've, I, I, I can't remember who it was, but I remember attending a, an industry panel about, about, you know, what makes a good short or something or other. And something uh, someone said really resonated with me, which is a gr great shorts are brave enough to leave things open-ended to, to suggest a life beyond the film, but not to try and wrap it all up neatly in a bow, which yeah. I think is, I think is such yeah. a great point. I, you talked earlier about, uh, I, you know, one of the things, the differences between shorts and features is the relative freedom to experiment, to innovate, as you've described, 
obviously when you're dealing with a feature, even a first feature, there are multiple parties wanting to see scripts, uh, wondering, you know, how the budget is shaping up, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Obviously your producer is, is, is to a certain extent fending off that, but, but you also are trying to stay true to yourself um, and, and also put forward a, a, a slightly unusual way of working. How do you do that? Like, how do you, even, even starting from early short films, how do you navigate the industry and, and stay true to yourself? Because you've got to compromise. There's no doubt about it. How do you do that but, but retain your integrity, your creative integrity? I think you start small and you prove that you can do it with that process. Um, and it doesn't mean you have to go full bang into that process. Like small change was a little bit of improvisation, but mostly script. Then with, you know, each time, then I did rough skin straight after that. And that was fully scripted because that was for Channel 4 coming up skiing. But I could still get these characterful moments and, you know, that felt improvised. And, and then, you know, so you, you're constantly pushing to prove that you can do that. And then people are willing to take a bigger and bigger chance yeah. with you. But ultimately, you need to be surrounded by people who believe in that process. Because if, if you, you know, there's different types of filmmakers, just like there's different producers. But if, you know, it's finding the producers that they get excited about. Okay, that's how you want to work okay, I've seen your work, I believe in you. What is it that you need? You need people who are excited and believe in you. And that's, that's a big part of it. Um, and, you know, that stuff has to be earned. You have to, you have to prove it yourself with small yeah. shorts. Um, before, it, you know, you can't expect it to be handed to you. Like from my first short to my feature was 10 years. You know, and in between that, I did TV. Again, to pay the bills, but equally to, to prove that, yes, I can carry this kind of budget because I've done it. I've hopped in on a TV series here and I've set up an entire TV yeah. series. So I, I think, for example, if I hadn't done the TV work, I wouldn't have ended up getting the budget. That's interesting. Uh, but, and what was really interesting, we were in the middle of prep for wildfire and, and we hadn't gone into prep. We were planning to shoot it. Um, and a, a line producer came over and he, he looked at the cost of the film and he was like, you know, your your user, you need a lot more money than you think for this. <laughs> and they, you know, he was right. He was re he was right, but I think it kind of shocked us all. Like, going, you didn't want to hear it at the time, probably. No, <laughs> <laughs> I, think I want to make it now. Do you know, like, I want to wait another year. Yeah. But you know, it was the best thing because that extra year, um, you know, we got we got another funder came on board, um. I, there wasn't massive compromises in the script. Mm. You know, the vision of the script is quite big. It's quite expansive. There's quite big set pieces in the film. Yeah. And it wasn't, I think if we'd gone straight away, it would have been like, you need to cut this out. You need to cut that out. Um, so it's about timing and it's about, you know, it's really about funders believing you as well. Yeah. And you only get that by earning it as well with shorts in your TV work. Sure. <laughs> Keep plugging away. Yeah. Talk of the budget brings us on to a, uh, a, uh, a, uh, a, uh, string of slightly more practical questions. So I'm going to start with one from um, Shadman. Hi, Shadman. Um, and the question is, what did the funding for the film cover? Is it all costs? What does it cover in terms of equipment and location access? Is, are we talking about uh, uh, Wildfire specifically or short? I think we're talking about, wild, unless um, Shadman wants to shout and say otherwise, I think we're talking about the feature. I mean, like, I'm not a producer, so they'll be able to tell you better, you know, but like, I think ultimately it's the whole production of it. So that'll be, you know, you will, you'll get obviously a separate fee in terms of as you're writing it and your workshops. Um, but I do think, I mean, I think on your first day of principal photography, I think the fee has to come out of your overall budget or, or so, there's something there. I'm sorry. A tranche I, gets released, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they have to, I think... So it, it does cover the entire, like it covers your pre-production, your production and your post. So you're, you know, you're covering yeah. all your, your crew, your cast. Um, but I think, I think maybe the question is, is, uh, is getting at the idea, it, it sort of, is everyone getting paid here? You know, is everyone getting paid? Is everyone, you know, there's, there's yeah. no, you know, it's, it's not about favours and freebies and it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's a slightly, it's a step up from short filmmaking in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. No, hugely. And, um, you know, I, I felt it was really important, again, because I, I feel like 
the film was ambitious and it needed a certain amount of money. But I think if you're hiring people with that level of skill and you're asking that much from them that, you know, everyone just needs to get paid. Yeah. And it's not a hobby at that stage because you put 10 years, you know, it's, yeah. it's a career. So uh, I was very sure that I wanted to wait. And I, I, I wasn't interested in making a micro budget uh, feature only because I'd done TV and I'd felt like, um, I had the hunger to do something at a bigger scale and I had written wildfire and it had a certain scale that didn't suit micro budget. Yeah. Um, and it felt like the right move for me. Now that's not the case with everyone, but that felt like the right move for me. It, 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 uh, it leads me on to another budget related question, which is for, I, I was about to say, I, I, hello, Anon, but I think actually it's Anon as in anonymous. So <laughs> <laughs> unless it's Anon, in which case, hi, Anon. Um, and the question is, do you have any tips for making a short film for next to no budget? Like, what do you have to, what's the, at the other end of the spectrum, what are your, a really what, good story. what's the approach there? A really good story is free. You know what I mean? If you're, if you're yeah. next to nothing, it just has to be an incredibly good story. Uh, and then your performance, your performance at the heart of it needs to be captivating. Because I think even if it was shot on an iPhone and the performance had something incredibly special about it, your audience would be engaged. And if they felt like they'd gone on a journey and there was something significant in terms of payoff, it doesn't matter what it's shot on. I think, you know, um, because the story's free, take the time to do it right. Mm you know um but making it is the thing like you know you got to remember that first short that i did when i was in art school like that was for next to nothing it wasn't necessarily a good short but it was the experience it wasn't only the next one that you know i started using a wee bit of savings i pulled in every favor under the sun like people who you know when i was making teas on sets you know i would see what they were doing i would help them and then you just asked you know would it be possible if you could mm. give me that that uh um gear for a reduced price this is what i have i think the important thing is you you offer something don't expect everything for nothing even if you have nothing then you need to save because i think it's it shows that you put value in people even if it's an actor like norgie and i didn't have much money but what i had was it was still like this is everything i have it's not i wasn't expecting her to work for free so that's i think it depends what talent you want to go with like it but if, if, you know, if you are going to approach someone for next to nothing, offer them something. Yeah. We, we talked a little bit uh, earlier in the session about uh, the, the, the routes available to emerging talent now to go into the, they might, they might make their way to a, a debut feature in a slightly less traditional way than, than you did perhaps, or maybe not, who knows. Yeah. But one thing that has shifted significantly, I think, since you started out, uh, with your early short films in particular, is the relationship between TV and film in, in this country. Well, in the world, really. Um, there used to be a, a sort of, a bit of a hierarchy, didn't there? A bit of snobbery between the film and TV world that seems to have collapsed more or less. Uh, the last major project you worked on before Wildfire was the TV series Can't Cope, Won't Cope, which you co-developed um, a dark comedy set in Dublin. And you directed the entire first series. You've already said that you think without that, the battle to make wildfire might have been even harder. Um, but w in terms of the landscape, you talked about directing for TV being a bit more of a gun for hire or feeling a bit more like a gun for hire. It, is, that, is that changing? What's the TV landscape like now for directors? And would you, if, if TV opportunities come along before a feature, would you say jump, jump at them, snap them up for, for emerging directors? I think so. The first bit of TV that I did was it was Jack Thorne's Glue, which was on E4. It was before, like, it, it was it was the start of that really interesting youth drama led TV. And you know, I so I had I was jumping in on the middle block. So there was you know there was the lead director who was already setting it up. There was another second director, and I was just bang in the middle to do one episode. And what made sense about that was it wasn't a million miles totally off wasted in terms of. Um, these characters who were kind of uh, pushing themselves to extreme to feel alive, but you know, there was something kind of poetic within it, but you know, it had a bit of a sensibility mm. and a bit of humor about it. So they could see what I had done was of interest. And equally, when I read the scripts, I was like, this, I get this. Yeah. And then I pitched for it and I was lucky enough to get it. And I had very similar tonal references when I came in to pitch for it. I think I brought in, like, I think I bought it in about 10 boards with photographs. I came in with, what I would imagine would be potential casting, 
what I would imagine would be potential score. And they were seeing that, oh, tonally, she's on the same page. So it was a really good fit. Yeah. Um, and, 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 a stam- and a stamina builder? Does it, does it sort of yeah. get you fit oh, for production? Yes, yes. Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I thought that, and then I did Canco Bunk Up, and then I realized that stamina. <laughs> yeah. What was nice about the, um, the Jack Thorne series, it was the budget was really big all of a sudden. The crew, the support, it was like, wow, they have a catering bus. <laughs> okay, wow. This is real. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? I was used to, like, getting my mum cooking food for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but then when, when it came to uh, Canco Bunk Up, the entire series was made for, it was a six-part series, but it was made for under a million. It sounds like a lot, but it's actually not a lot. Um, we were shooting 10 pages a day. Uh, it was just intense. And... It, that was stamina building and it yeah. also I'm really glad and really grateful for that opportunity but it's not how I want to make TV yeah. so I've learned that okay I can set up a TV series I can set up the world I can cast it the look and feel of it but now next time I want to return to a bigger budget I don't necessarily want to be setting up a, a feature a TV world just yet but if I'm going to hop in I'm going to go higher end because I feel yeah. like the support around or what you can do, you can achieve more. And plus I've kind of, during the feature, I hopefully will have earned that opportunity as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like stepping stones and, you know, you know, sometimes like, you know, glue was much higher in budget, but, you know, I was right in the middle. Canco Bunko was much lower in budget, but I got to do all six apps. So, you know, so yeah. it's in one way to step forward and a step back and it's just yeah. about experience. Yeah, yeah. What One thing we haven't talked about yet that is vitally important I think um, and is not talked about enough is the role that film festivals can play in in career development particularly when you're making those shorts that and you know when you're making a name for yourself in 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 the short film world um Noel and Eddie Mould both had questions related to film festivals which are effectively uh how much work did you put in submitting your films and pushing your films yourself and and how important were festivals for you in moving you on in your career well let me tell you this right so i remember um i remember putting a uh, small change into the foil film festival which is you know it's a uh, it was out an academy one so you kind of you try to go for the bigger ones and I remember um, they got back and said that it, it didn't get in. And I was curious, so I, I, I can't remember why. Um, I rang them up and they said, sorry, it was just a student film. And then I was able to go, well, actually, I just got into Sundance, so screw you, <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But like, I didn't say that directly, but what I'm trying to say is sometimes with the short film world, it's about taste and it's about the right person seeing your film and believing in you and, you know, you somehow get in but you have to keep trying because there is so many shorts and there's so many different programmers um but don't give up that festival you believe in doesn't like your work and it's very it's very easy to say that and it's very hard to do that and not take things personal but like um it's just the way the world works yeah. you know and so just keep going yes i do think shorts are uh, festivals are really important i think they can be expensive as well mm. um so you know you want to be selective about what ones that you want to you want to um apply to and and you know maybe have ones that are closer to home as well because it could be a case of word of mouth get you to that other yeah. festival but you got to kind of be quite smart about you know you can only have one world premiere and the bigger festivals you get they have to have premiere so yeah you just be smart about it but it is about hitting the big ones you know your a your a class festivals then you drop down to your b's and often when you get into an a one then the b festivals start contacting you and it's much easier and you get fee waivers and stuff like that yeah. it is it's really time consuming mm-hmm. but at least now you don't have to print off the dvds and post them like no there are one-stop shop websites aren't there exactly exactly yeah. so much easier yeah, and there are, it's worth mentioning that places like uh, the British Council support filmmakers to travel to international festivals if they get in. They have a list of festivals, certain festivals that that um, help filmmakers to travel to. And I think they created some resources with BAFTA a few years ago, videos that can be found on their websites about this topic, about navigating the world of short film festivals. Because it is, it can feel like a bit of a labyrinth, I think, when you're starting out. But um, but yeah, like you say, people, people, people shouldn't give up. Um, it's coming up to five o'clock, so which means we're running out of time a bit. I would just like to finish up really by asking you a, a, a slightly open question, which is what advice would you give to 
Kathy Brady, who is just starting out on that first short. <laughs> Given what you know now, what would you oh what would you what God. would you be whispering in her ear on day one of on day one of shooting? You are you're much better than you think. And you gotta start believing in yourself. And only when you believe in yourself or is other people gonna start believing in you. And you need that confidence to carry a feature. And um it's gonna be a difficult ride, but the experiences and the people you meet will be so worth it. Yeah. Brilliant advice. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy. And thank you everyone that put questions forward. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them, but hopefully we covered enough of the themes that came up to, for it to be satisfying. Kathy, I, I find it personally rare to speak to a filmmaker who's so articulate and, and generous with their experience. So, so thank you. For those of you who haven't seen Wildfire yet, you're in for an absolute treat. Um, I won't say any more because of, of the potential spoilers, but it really is an exceptional debut. And I think, and, you know, one of those debuts that is in a year of fantastic debuts, actually in British filmmaking, if, if you were to look at the debut, first and second features coming out of the UK at the moment, I think you would say it was an absolutely very exciting time for, for, for British filmmaking, reflecting the here and now, particularly wildfire coinciding with some of the broader political conversations that are going on, <laughs> you know, as we speak. So, I hope you all enjoy it. Um, I've really enjoyed speaking to you, Kathy. Thank you so much, and thank you, Alex, for for having us and for um, and, and and for the session. Thank you, Will and Kathy, and thank you, Kathy, so much for all your tips and advice. I'm sure that was much appreciated by our attendees. Before you guys go, I just wanted to let you know that you'll be receiving an email from Eventbrite shortly after this event with a link to a short survey. It would be great if you could let us know what you thought of today's session and how you think we can improve our events, um, our upcoming events. Um, it will only take a couple of minutes to complete and we read every single one of them. So please do it if you can. Um, and I also wanted to let you know that we have two more events coming up as part of the Film Academy Day today. Um, if you enjoy the hotspot with Kathy Brady, we have another hotspot coming up for our Film Academy delegates at 8 p.m. That's a hotspot with Jennifer Sheridan, who has her debut feature in the festival as well. That's Rose Love Story. So for those of you like horror lovers, um, yeah, I've seen it as well. It's great. It's great. It's really great. Um, do join us. Uh, but also at 6 p.m., the next event is free for everyone to attend. And it's an event about immersive storytelling inspired by two projects in our LFF expanded installation, Eldpel and To Miss a Thing. So it's not too late to register for either of those events, um, but join us if you can. Thank you again, Will. Thank you, Kathy. And Pleasure. see you Thank everyone you. at 6 p.m. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.